We are going to talk about alternating current circuits now. So before, we've only talked about having a constant, um, a constant current. And what that looks like is if you put your, uh, is it, we've only talked about constant voltage, which means that you have a, um, either a constant current or that you are slowly building up towards some equilibrium system. So your voltage in that case is a constant. Um, and uh, so as a function of time, this is what your voltage looks like. When you have an alternating current circuit, um, what you're going to do is instead of applying a constant current, you're going to apply an oscillating current. And usually that oscillation is chosen to be approximately sinusoidal, about zero. Sinusoidal meaning following a sine function. So we're going to look at something like this. Um, so then when you, have an, when you apply an oscillating voltage, um, you end up getting oscillatory in behavior in your circuit elements. So when we talked about the capacitor, when you apply a voltage, um, a constant voltage to the capacitor, it basically just slowly charges up. And then it, once it's fully charged, it stays there. Um, when you have an oscillating current, it's going to charge up and then discharge and charge up and then discharge. And this is really interesting for the way that circuits behave. Um, so we're going to talk about the consequences of that. We are going to start with the simplest of our circuit elements. So when you have a, an oscillating current, first of all, this is denoted by this symbol with a, uh, with a wiggle on it, indicating that the voltage that you are applying is an oscillatory voltage. And you put it simply in, uh, in series with a, um, with a resistor. Um, so you're applying a voltage which varies between sinusoidally between the maximum voltage and the negative maximum voltage. Um, and we've chosen to put this as a sinusoidal variation. Um, and then as we apply that voltage, so it's across a simple resistor, um, so current is going to, to flow through the resistor when the voltage is, this is a resistor is an ohmic device, meaning that it, follows V equals I R. Um, and when we apply our uh, oscillatory voltage to the resistor, we will get a resistance which, or a current which oscillates in phase with the, the, um, with the voltage. So it will oscillate. Um, it will have a different value because it's a different unit. And then it will oscillate it so that the maximum current is the maximum at the maximum voltage, the minimum current is the minimum at the minimum, um, at the minimum voltage. So the current in this case, when the voltage is positive, the current is going this way. When the current is negative, the, um, when the voltage is negative, the current is, os is going in this direction. So here, um, you can see, this is showing just in greater detail, the output of a sinusoidal, uh, so AC stands for alternating current. Um, and uh, here this shows the output of an alternating current source as a function of time um, so that the cycle repeats itself every, uh, oh, when omega T is equal to two pi and four pi and six pi and on. Um, and as I said, this is the symbol that indicates an alternating current source in a circuit diagram. So now we're going to add circuit elements. Here, you see your alternating current source hooked up in series with a resistor. The, um, so here, we've plotted both on the same plot where the scale is different for the current and for the, the voltage. So I actually would prefer to have this labeled V comma I, because depending on which curve you're looking at, it's a different number. Um, so here, the current is in phase with the, um, with the voltage. So when the voltage is positive, the current is going in this direction. So you've got current going in this direction, and then the current slows down and changes direction when the voltage flips negative, 
and then it slows down and flips direction when the, the voltage goes positive. And because a, uh, because a resistor is an ohmic device, they are exactly in phase. We will introduce something called a phasor diagram. So when you have something oscillating, you can also think of it as um, looking at the projection onto the, so you guys are now in your second semester introductory physics class, so you should be reasonably comfortable with vectors. So if I tell you, so if you t I tell you, I'm gonna have to tell you to think of this as like a vector. So think of the current as like a vector. And the physical current is the projection of that vector onto the x-axis. So, um, well, we'll start with the voltage. Think of the voltage as like a, ve uh, like a vector, which is rotating around. And I'm looking at the x component. And the x component of the voltage is going to be, here, my angle is omega t. So I do the projection onto the x-axis. And this length here, this physical voltage is V naught sine omega T. So I can then describe my voltage as the projection onto the x axis as my voltage vector rotates. Now I have a current vector that does that likewise is rotating. And for a simple resistor, that current vector is lined up exactly, um, it is exactly in phase with the, um, with the voltage vector. I don't know if I can move my arms. Well, I can probably move them in phase. So this guy is my voltage vector. This guy is my current vector. And they're rotating together and the, pro the projection onto the x-axis is the, um, the projection onto the x-axis is the physical value. So the projection of my voltage vector onto the x-axis is the physical value of the voltage. The projection of my current at vector onto the x-axis is the physical value of the current as I do this. Now, this is not such a useful tool when you're simply looking at a plain old resistor, um, but you have to understand how to apply it to a resistor to understand what happens when you get more complicated circuit elements. Because now we're gonna talk about what happens with a capacitor. So this is our old friend, the capacitor. When we had a direct current, as, as soon as we hooked up the voltage supply, um, for a direct current, what happened was that the um, the voltage applied across the capacitor led charge to build up across the capacitor. So as while you had charge building up on the capacitor, you had current in the, in the circuit. And as the charge built up on the capacitor uh, approached its equilibrium value, eventually, so the, the current slowed down and eventually the current approached zero. Um, so if you remember from a couple of chapters before, um, you had a current which went like the initial current e to the negative p over tau, where tau was the time constant of the circuit. And then you had a voltage which went like uh, across the capacitor, which went something like V naught, one minus E to the negative T over tau um, across the capacitor. Now, as that voltage, as that, um, as that charge builds up on the capacitor, we're actually changing the voltage applied to the circuit. So, here we've got the voltage applied shown in V, uh, shown in blue, um, and I'm going to just go ahead and trace it so that it's visible to you guys because it's a little dim. So this is our voltage applied. 
and it's going up and down. Fortunately, it's a lot smoother than my drawing. And then when we consider what happens to that capacitor, at the very beginning, we have no voltage applied across the capacitor. So, um, ah, well, if we had just flipped the switch on, there was no voltage applied across the capacitor, but we would have been coming off of a, uh, off of the, um, off of the scenario where there had been current flowing. So I'm actually gonna start talking about it here. All of a sudden, we turn the circuit on at the maximum of voltage applied. And we're starting the system with no current across our, uh, no current in our circuit. So, ah, so sorry, this is, all right, voltage across the capacitor. We are charging up the, so once we've reached the point where the, the capacitor is fully charged, the voltage across the capacitor is right here. And here you can tell voltage sub C. Now we do have to be careful because we're talking about when we get multiple circuit elements, the voltage across the different components is not always going to be in phase. So we have to watch those subscripts. We're gonna use the notation I sub C and uh, V sub C. I sub C is the current through the capacitor and V sub C is the, is the voltage across the capacitor. All right, so we're gonna actually start here. The capacitor has no current going through it because it's fully charged. And all of a sudden, and I flip this on, and, bec and I have, because it's fully charged, I'm pushing some of the charge away. There's a lot of potential energy, and I'm starting to decrease the, um, the voltage applied. So when I decrease the voltage applied, th that capacitor is it's got so much energy stored from, so much potential energy from the charges being forced close together, it's push, pushing charge away. So as soon as I start decreasing the voltage applied across the capacitor, I start, a, I have current flowing that way out of the capacitor. So my current is negative. And then at some point, my voltage reaches across the capacitor reaches zero. And at the point that the voltage across the capacitor is zero, then, and I start applying a, um, I'm now applying a voltage in the opposite direction. So now it's the, the um, there's slight, a slight negative voltage. So char positive charges want to go this way. I really start ramping up those positive charges. And I am going to do that I ramp up the positive charges, and as I do that, the positive charges are building up enough potential on that capacitor that they're pushing back. So they're slowing that current down until it can't go anymore. And at the point that that current can't go anymore, I've actually reached a potential applied of zero, and I start applying a positive potential, which starts pushing, pushing the charge back back. Uh, is this, so I get current in the opposite direction until I reach the max, maximum. And I keep doing this so that then what happens is that you see that the current is out of phase with the capacitance. So here, this is written suggestively like this. I naught equals sine omega t plus pi over two. It's, it's out of phase by exactly 90 degrees. Um, so um, then you can actually take this. So sine, uh, sines and cosines, um, sine and co sines and cosines are related by being phase shifted relative to each other. So if I just look at this graph of the current, I can tell that that looks like a cosine. So I can also write 
I, ooh, this marker is toast. I can write that my current I sub C as a function of time is also equal to I naught cosine omega T. For the purpose of phasor diagrams, we're going we're gonna to use this formulation because it makes it just a little bit easier to see. And then we're going to go revisit that phasor diagram because now that phasor diagram is a little bit more useful. Now, here we have our old friend, the voltage. Um, we have the voltage represented as a vector, and the physical value of the voltage is the projection onto that x-axis, and our current vector, and the physical value of our current vector is the projection onto the x-axis as well. The difference is that now um, these two vectors are out of phase. So here, this is what we would physically measure for the current. And ah, this is actually doing the projection. This is projection, project, projecting onto the y-axis, but either way. Um, you're looking at the, because I, yes, it's projecting onto the y-axis because it's using the sign. I like doing it the other way. Okay, projecting onto the y-axis because it's the sign. Um, and then, voltage vector, current vector, except now as I can, I'm not as good at doing this with my, at rotating my hands my arms out of phase. My brother is a cheerleader, so he actually probably is a little better at that. He's got more physical coordination than I do. All right, and then we can get to an inductor. So um, now we have our inductor, um, and we have the, the same thing. Um, and we're applying a voltage across the, the inductor, and it varies sinusoidally. Um, and now, when I start, and I'm applying zero voltage, uh, well, yeah, I want to start. Again, I think find it a little easier to start at this point. I'm applying, uh, I'm applying my maximum voltage here, shown in blue. Um, and, let me, and then I am, when I apply a voltage, and I'm going to start with zero current through the inductor. So suddenly, when I start applying a voltage, it is very easy for current to flow through that inductor because at first, there's no current flowing through the inductor. So it just looks like a wire to the, to the charge carriers in that circuit. But as I increase the amount of current in the inductor, the current slows down because then we're building up this magnetic field inside of that inductor, and nature abhors changing magnetic flux. So it's going to fight. So as you increase the current, the magnetic field in that inductor is increasing, and the current slows down until it's until it reaches its maximum. And at the point that it reaches its maximum, we have basically turned off the current. We're at, the, we're at a zero in our, we've turned off our voltage. We're at a zero in our voltage. And we've got a lot of current going through there. And our voltage is flipping sign. Now, the current's all going to try to, it's going to, not a, it's going to reduce the amount of, um, the voltage is pushing the inductor to reduce the amount of current through it, um, and, but the inductor is fighting it because if you, you're at your maximum current, if your current is decreasing, you're changing the magnetic field. And it just got used to that magnetic field, and it 
doesn't want to move. And so now, maybe, maybe you can think of, uh, I have small children, maybe you can think of, of charge carriers as a bit like children, that they don't like changing what they're doing, so you get them moving, and once they're moving, they, they want to keep moving. Now you have to get them stopped. And it just takes a while to get them stopped. Okay, so we've got that the currents at its maximum. It wants to stay at the maximum, but you just changed the, the voltage. It's got to slow down, and it will sl eventually slow down and stop. And then, and then the current, the voltage in the other direction is pushing it to accelerate in the other direction. And it's just fighting it every little way. So what you find now is that that inductor, just like the capacitor, the, um, the current across, through the inductor is also out of phase with the, the applied voltage because that inductor is fighting any change that you try to make it make. So the inductor is lagging the, um, is lagging the voltage change. So now we have the current um, in the, across the inductor, and note here we have an I sub L is sine omega T minus pi over two. And for the record, you can flip the sines and cosines here, you just, if you flip, Change one to sine, you have to, to cosine, you have to change all of them to cosine. Um, so that current is, uh, through that inductor, is lagging the voltage that comes afterwards. Because that, that inductor abhors change. All right, so here we have the phasor diagram. So whereas our, um, so this is our voltage. When we had a capacitor, our voltage across the capacitor was 90 degrees this way. Now our voltage across the capacitor, and th this mirrors every image, so I think that you guys are, well, it doesn't matter. So I think you're seeing, whereas I see this as going counterclockwise, you should see this as going clockwise. Um, all right, so now, whereas for the uh, capacitor, my current was here. For the inductor, my current is there. I cannot move my arms at 90 degree angles to each other very well in a coordinated way. So that's why the phasor diagrams are useful, because they help you see what's actually going on with the relative uh, amplitudes of the um, of the um, of the system, and that, and and so you can think of it. They always stay out of phase, but they're rotating together. All right, now we're gonna put these all together. So, but we had talked about our L circuits, our C circuits, and LC circuits, and now we're gonna put them all together in an RLC circuit. Um, and these have a ton of applications. All right, so now. We've got our inductor, our capacitor, and our resistor. And it matters which one. Um, so here, when you talk about the current, you're talking about the current in the entire circuit as a whole. Um, and if you look at the current through individual circuit components, they can be different. So here we have our, um, uh, we have the current through the, the voltage applied to the circuit in blue and the current in the circuit in red. Um, and now because, so our resistor doesn't shift the phase of that current at all, but our capacitor and our inductor do. So the exact value of the phase difference is going to depend on what the values of R, L, and C are. So when we look at the, um, so when we look at all of the voltages, we're going to have three voltages now. We have a voltage across our resistor, a voltage across our capacitor, and a voltage across our inductor. And they're all going to rotate together, but at any given point in time, 
they can take different values. And then um, the total, so when you go back to this circuit, the total voltage across all elements, the voltage across the inductor plus the voltage across the capacitor plus the voltage across the resistor has to equal the voltage that you applied. So what that means is that if you add the voltage across the resistor plus the voltage across the, so let me go back to this one. We're going to add the voltage across the resistor to the voltage across the inductor to, and add, then add the voltage across the capacitor. You, that's hard to draw simultaneously. So the trick that we're going to use is that we're going to draw, the, we're going to draw the voltage across the inductor minus the voltage across the capacitor. And that's going to make, that's our first addition minus the magnitude of the voltage across the inductor. So we're adding this vector to that vector. And that gives us a, you know, this is the sum of the inductor and vector capacitors, voltages. And then we're going to add them to the voltage across the resistor. And we had better get the voltage that we applied to the circuit. And in fact, this gives you one way that you can check your work if you have to give expressions for the voltages across all three of them. You can add them all up and they better add up to the voltage that you applied or else you have a math mistake. Well, you can always have an additional math mistake, but if you don't get that, you must have the wrong answer. All right, so here this shows, this is a little bit hard to read, um, because it's so small, but this shows graphs of the instantaneous power. Um, okay, remember that power equals the current times the voltage. Um, and then, um, and this is, so this is the average, this is telling us that for the resistor, the average power is the amplitudes divided by two. Um, this is doing this and showing that those, that's the average power is a little bit tricky. Um, so here we can actually, let's, let's do that one. A little bit of calculus. So we have that our current is, let me write this. Our current is equal to our maximum current sine omega for the resistor. Current is equal to maximum current sine omega t. I don't have to worry about phase shifts for the resistor. Voltage is equal to maximum voltage sine omega t. And then our power is equal to the maximum current times the maximum voltage times sine squared omega t. And then if I want to calculate the average, we, we denote the average by putting brackets around a value. So putting the p in brackets means that I'm looking at the average. And this is i naught, v naught, and then I'm going to integrate, well, let me write it in general. The average of our power is going to equal one over, an average over one cycle. So one over the period of, from zero to the period times the power as a function of time, the integral of the power as a function of time, dt, divided by t. Now I have to figure out my period. My period is when omega t is equal to 2 pi. So t is equal to 2 pi over omega.
and I'm going to try using these different markers. These guys work a little better, but they make me write slower, and I'm not a slow person. Okay, so now I am going to integrate. So I'll just keep this over here, and later I'm going to plug it in when we look at our limits. Um, so now that integral is I naught V naught over the period times the integral from 0 to t of sine squared omega t dt. I don't have a rule for this, but I have a half angle formula. My half angle formula says that this is equal to 1 half minus 1 half cosine of 2 omega t. All right, so then my integral is i naught v naught over t times the integral from 0. Ooh, I think I had better start this on another line. I will move it slightly down here so I have enough room. So this is equal to I naught V naught over T times the integral from zero to T of one half minus one half cosine two omega T D T. This first integral is really easy because I just have t over 2. And then here I have negative 1 half over 1 over 2 omega sine 2 omega t, and then let me check, check the sine, S-I-D-N. So sine is increase, so the derivative of sine is positive because it increases at the beginning. So the derivative of the sine is cosine and not, uh, not negative cosine. All right, and then here I have to put in my limits from 0 to t. Um, so when I put in my upper limit, sine omega, sine of 2 omega t, um, this is sine of, let me put it up here, sine of 2 omega times 2 pi over omega is 4 pi, which is 0. And then sine of 0 is 0. So my average, so this term goes to 0. And I am left with an average power of i naught v naught over 2. Because this t cancels that t, exactly like the book says. So when I look at this average power, it works out to I naught V naught over two. Okay, so that worked. That was the easy one. Um, and I'm not going to go through the math on the others. But now because the power is equal to the current times the voltage, when I have both the capacitor and the inductor, um, then I... Uh, then I have the, uh, these guys are out of phase, so it's a little bit trickier. Um, and because then I can't use the half angle formula, I have to use cosine addition formulas and they get a little bit messier. Um, but if you plot the power as a function of time, so, in the case of the capacitor, um, so 
you, and you, whether you have the capacitor or the resistor, because you're always out of phase, you are always going to end up with terms like I naught, V naught, cosine omega t, sine omega t. And those of you that remember your trig identities will recognize that this is I naught, V naught, times 2 sine omega t. Now, in one case, it's a positive sign because in one case, when, you're cha when you have uh, cosine, when you have sine omega t plus, no, sine omega t minus uh, pi over 2, you get cosine omega t, and in the opposite, you get negative cosine. So sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. But either way, you end up with a power that goes like sine omega t. And when you look at the average of that, over time, it, the average is 0. So the average power through the inductor and through the capacitor is 0. And then you want to look at the average in the circuit. Now, note that this I naught is not necessarily the I naught through the entire circuit. So now the average power through the entire circuit, you're going to have to look at, you're going to have to add the currents through each of the components. And the average power through the entire circuit is going to take a slightly different value, which depends on the phase angle. I will leave that ugly math up to, as an exercise to the student. That phrase, we joke about that in physics, that usually means it's a lot of hairy, ugly math. In an introductory physics class, that means it's a lot of boring, ugly math. Later on, it can be a lot of difficult, ugly math. All right, so then these RLC circuits have a phenomenal and exciting property called resonance. Resonance is very cool. So um, when you have the, um, so when you have this RLC circuit and you are applying different voltages, we didn't specify what the voltage you were applying is, um, but when you look at the, um, the current across the circuit um, and you add up these phase, these, uh, the current in, um, you add up the currents considering that they are in fact out of phase, what you see is that the current across the circuit depends on the values of R, L, and C. And for certain values of um, certain, it also depends on the applied voltage. So for certain values, certain phase, certain um, frequencies of applied voltage, you get different current across the circuit. So you plot, this is the functional form of your voltage of your, this actually should not have a zero. I made that myself in the slide and I had a typo. So this is just the current across the circuit goes like the applied voltage divided by this mess. Well, this goes to, uh, this goes to the largest value when this term is equal to zero. Um, so if you plot your current as a function of the applied um, angular frequency, what you will see is this, that there is a peak, and it peaks at omega naught, where omega naught is the thing that makes that zero. So that is when these two terms are equal to zero, or omega naught equals 1 over LC. So if you happen to drive the circuit, we call this the driving, um, the driving voltage because you're forcing the circuit to move. If you drive, if you ha drive the circuit at exactly that frequency, um, you will get resonance. So um, then we have the, um, we can also look at the average power. Um, and the average power also fr 
uh, has this peak about that resonant frequency. This behavior where you end up with a maximum in power at a certain frequency is called resonance. It's going to come up. It actually came up last semester when we studied, uh, when we studied simple harmonic motion. If you get things shaking at the right speed, it will shake even more. And this is electronic resonance. If you get the circuit shaking at just right, the right speed, the amplitude increases. Now, it's slightly damped because of that resistance. The resistor keeps it from going to infinity. And there's, even if you didn't put a resistor in your circuit, there's always some resistance in the electron in the wires. Um, so it will never really go to infinity, but you can get it shaking pretty fast. All right, and then we can use this to talk about, well, we can use our circuit elements to talk about transformers. Um, so what are transformers? As you probably don't know, when those overhead power lines that you see all over the place travel, they are not moving currents at, uh, they are not moving the electric power at the voltages that you have at the wall. It actually turns out that you have a lot more losses if you moved electron if you move power at those voltages. So instead of the, well, this says 240 volts, um, that is what is used in most of, um, your wall voltage actually use, is 120 in the United States and 240 in most of the rest of the world, except not in Latin America. Um, so in the Americas, it tends to be 120. 20 volts, and in Europe and the rest of the world, it tends to be 240. Um, so what it actually happens is that you, the applied voltage, and this is all, all of the voltage is tra transmitted in alternating currents. It actually turns out that direct currents lose a lot more energy a lot faster. You lose less energy when you transmit power through power lines as alternating currents. So you start at extremely high voltages, and at various points in the and along the line, it will actually uh, step the, so here it goes from 12 kilovolts up to 400 kilovolts because you have few, you have smaller percentage losses when you, uh, when you move the power at high voltages and then when you're getting closer to the house you will step it down so that it is a lower transmission. Lower voltages are safer for people and animals. Um, and then when you get right to the house, you step it down closer to what you're actually applying. All right, so how do you step down, um, how do you have a transformer? So here you can have coupled, um, coupled inductors. So now um, what we have here is a, uh, we have an, AC circuit. We have windings of the um, windings of wire, and uh, the way that this works is that you typically have an iron core, and this iron core, as you increase, as you change the current in this uh, in this circuit, that magnetizes the iron here. And the magnetic domains in iron are coupled. It's going to, so you will have the same magnetic flux in this circuit as in this circuit. So as you change the um, magnetic flux here, this, uh, this circuit has the, um, well, the magnetic field in the iron core is the same. And then the magnetic flux is the number of windings times the magnetic field in one winding. So you can change the magnetic flux in this circuit by changing the number of windings. So then the, um, you have the voltage in the primary circuit coupled to the voltage in the secondary circuit, and it works out so that the voltage in the, second, the prime, secondary circuit divided by the voltage in the primary circuit is equal to the, the number of windings in the secondary circuit divided by the number of windings in the primary circuit. Now, you can design different relative numbers of um, primary and secondary windings, so you can actually change the, the voltage over here. And then we can move on to examples. So here, a 1.5 kilo ohm, uh, let's see, well, this doesn't match the, the word. All right, so you have a resistor and an inductor and uh, this is, does not match the problem. 
So we will go with uh, the, so for ignore the words, those words are incorrect for this problem. The question is, what are, is, are the total impedance, the phase angle, um, and the, write an expression for the current in the circuit. And this one, we can use the expressions. So the total impedance, we use Z. Um, and I may come back to that and explain that a little bit more. Z is equal to the resistance, the square root of the resistance squared plus the impedance of the inductor minus the impedance of the capacitor quantity squared. And the impedance of the inductor is omega L. And the impedance of the capacitor, these should be size, not x's. Um, the impedance of the capacitor is omega C. Sorry, is 1 over omega C. And in, when you do that, your, volt, your current maximum current is equal to the maximum voltage applied divided by Z. So that makes it a little easier. Um, so then what we would do to calculate the impedance is look these numbers up. And we have 5 ohms quantity squared plus we are driving it at, so here our omega is, you can read off of this equation, we're driving it with an omega of 120 pi. So here we have 120 pi times 25 millihenries. And this will work out to have units of ohms minus, uh, and notice how I'm in the habit of always converting, converting things immediately into scientific notation. And we have 1 over 120 pi times our capacitance is 400 microfarads. So that is 400 times 10 to the negative 6 farads. Oh, and this has units of inverse seconds. And we square that and take the square root. And I'm not going to plug the numbers in. You guys can do that. We would then take that. Um, so our current in the circuit is going to be the maximum current applied, 170 volts, divided by our answer from the um, from the previous step. And then the phase angle works. So for the phase angle, tan of phi is the impedance of the inductor minus the impedance of the capacitor, capacitor divided by the resistance. So 120 pi times 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2 minus 1 over 120 pi times 4 times 10 to the negative 4 divided by 5. Um, and then when you take the inverse tangent, you have to be... Um, <coughs> you have to be careful because you get multiple answers. 
And you have to make sure that you get the, um, the phase, you know, you'll get two possible answers positive. So you have to just look at it a little bit and make sure it makes sense. All right. So for this one, we need, we are asked, what is the resistance R in the circuit shown below if the amplitude of the AC through the inductor is 4.24 amps? So the AC standing for alternating current. Um, so what that really means, the, uh, so this is amps, this is, that is telling us the current through the, um, inductor. So we are given I naught through the inductor is 4.24 amps. Uh, and then we, uh, we are given that the, um, so that is the amplitude the, we are given that the voltage, we know that the voltage through the capacitor is the, mat, the current through the circuit times the impedance of the capacitor. The impedance of the capacitor is 1 over omega times the capacitance. The voltage across the inductor is the voltage across the uh, the current across the circuit times the impedance of the inductor, where the impedance of the inductor is omega L. For the resistor, this is simple. Voltage is the current times R. This Maximum, what I'm doing here is building up our toolkit um, so that we have the tools to solve this. This is the amplitude applied. So in this circuit, that V naught is 50 volts. Okay, so the only thing, so we are told all of the components of the circuit, ah, and this one has another trick, which is that we have two capacitances, two capacitors, so this has an effective capacitance. These two capacitors are in parallel, and the capacitance of capacitors in parallel, I'm going to combine those two capacitors into one circuit element. So our equivalent circuit is this with a capacitance of 600 microfarads. The inductance doesn't change. The resistance doesn't change, and our applied voltage doesn't change. So this tells us that V naught is 50 volts and omega is 120 pi. And we are asked for R. We can solve for I naught, which is the voltage over the inductor. Wait, we do not need that because this has got to be equal. Well, this has got to be equal to I naught because that is the amplitude of the current through the circuit. The current through the circuit is the same for all elements because everything is in series now. So if that's the um, if that's I naught, we then can algebraically solve for R squared.
All right, so this is our expression for the resistance. Um, I'm not going to put the numbers in. That is left as an exercise for the students. Okay, so this is a multi-part multi one that is going to tell us how to do almost everything with the um, with these circuits. Um, all right, we have a, so it says we have a 1.5 kilo omega kilo ohm uh, resistor and a 30 millihenry inductor are connected in series as shown below across a 120 volt power source uh, oscillating at a 60 hertz frequency and specifically it gives us the root mean squared voltage so we have to first um, interpret that um, to a maximum amplitude so often the root mean squared voltage is uh, is given for these power supplies because it is directly related to the power. So because these are sinusoidal, just like a, a few slides ago when I went through calculating the average power, um, we uh, you can calculate that the average, so the app, if you take a sinusoidal function, and you calculate the average of it. So the average of the voltage squared, it matters where that square is. So the square is inside. So the average voltage squared, the voltage squared is always positive, will be V naught squared over two. The root mean squared, and that, that is just, I will leave this as an exercise for the student because I did it a couple slides ago. That is just taking one over the period times the integral from zero to the period of the voltage as a function of time quantity squared dt. I can even set the integral up for you. So you're going to, when you do this, you're going to get one half minus uh, cosine of two omega t. The integral of the two omega t goes away um, because it's zero. And then you're left with one half t. So your total integral is v naught squared over two. Um, so that, then the root mean squared means that you take the mean, the square of the mean, or sorry, the, the mean of the square, and then you take the square root of that. And this is an important quantity in physics that's actually going to come up in other contexts as well. It also comes up a lot in statistics. The square root of the average of the square is not equal to the is not equal to the average of the value itself in general there are cases where this is true but in general this is not true and sinusoidal functions are one of those cases where this is not true so the square root of the average, this is a root mean squared. So the, that is the square root of the average of the square is going to equal V naught over the square root of two. So when interpreting this problem, what we have to do is first recognize that we are given the root mean squared and not the actual amplitude of the voltage. So we are told that the root mean squared voltage is 120 volts. 
when the root mean squared voltage is 120 volts, the amplitude is 120 volts times the square root of 2. I'm going to rearrange that so that the so that it looks a little nicer. 120 times the square root of 2 volts. So that is actually our amplitude. And then we are asked to find the current. I'm going to just keep a tally of the stuff that we have to find. The current in the circuit and the voltage drops across the resistor and the inductor. And then the impedance of the circuit. And then the power in each of, let's see, the power in the inductor, the power in the resistor, and the power of the source. Oh, I'm gonna, you can't read that over the words. I'll just list them on. Okay. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is use some of our, what I know is that the, uh, I'm going to pick the easy ones first because you should always start with the easy stuff. Um, Remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. If you start with the easy things first, it may actually help you see the answers to the other problems. All right, so the power through the inductor is zero. I know that because we, we covered that a, in a, a little bit ago. So we have that the power is equal to the current through the power through the inductor is equal to the, the current through the inductor times the voltage across the inductor. And the voltage across the inductor uh, and the power across the uh, inductor, the, the voltage across the inductor and the current uh, through the inductor are out of phase. So I have I naught for the inductor, or I naught, which is I naught for everything, the voltage for the, the V naught for the inductor, and then here my applied voltage will just, we pick sine or cosine, we'll pick sine because we'll stick with the conventions in the book. So the, the voltage, the, the Voltage in the inductor, across the inductor, will have sine omega t. And then the, um, the current will have cosine omega t. And then this is equal to 2 i naught v0 l. And then check those trig identities. Ah, that is actually a one half times sine of two omega t. All right, the average of a sinusoidal function across one period is equal to zero. So, and I, I should have used the averages here. And so we have our first one, which is that the average power across the inductor is equal to zero. All right, then the next one is relatively easy, at least to me, because I got these equations memorized. We are going to, we need the impedance. So the impedance 
uh, is if you, so the impedance, you actually can use the same equation for an RLC circuit, except that you set the C, well, the C term goes away because you don't have a capacitor. You can't set it to zero because the, the capacitance comes in as one over, uh, it's one over the capacitance. So you can't set it equal to zero, but you can set the impedance from the capacitance to zero. So our equation for the impedance is then the resistance squared plus the impedance of the inductor squared, the square root of that. So um, we, ah, and it's uh, the frequency is, we're given that the frequency is 60 hertz. And that corresponds to omega equals 2 pi f. So that corresponds to 120 pi hertz. Where hertz is 1 over seconds. So um, our impedance is then... 1.5 times 10, this is a kilo ohm, so times 10 to the third ohms squared plus, now we need the impedance of an inductor is omega times L. So for this inductor, it is 120 pi times 30 times 10, this is a millihenry, so 30 times 10 to the negative 3 henrys. And here I have 300, or I have 360 pi times 10 to the negative 3. And I can make that 3.6 pi, ah, 300, well, or I can make it 0.36 times pi. So, then this is 0.36 pi quantity squared and the square root of that. Now, from, ooh, you cannot read that. I have to write it under the... So, uh, uh, quantity squared. I can tell by looking at these numbers, this number is a lot bigger than that number. So it's for a very good approximation, this is just 1.5 um, kilo ohms. Okay, so then I will just check it off the box. I will not plug the numbers in, but that is how we get the impedance. Um, we are going to keep this up here because, um, let's see, here we've gotten, once we have gotten that impedance, uh, our amplitude, to get this, we need the amplitude of the current. The amplitude of our current is... The voltage divided by the amplitude of the voltage divided by the impedance. All right, so then now that we have our impedance, then we have our, we just take that. I'm going to guess that that does with rounding work out to be 1.5 kilo ohms. So our impedance is 120 um, times the square root of 2 volts divided by our total impedance, which is about. 1.5 times 10 to the third kilo ohms, and it works out to have units of amps. Once we have the amplitude of our current, our current as a function of time is uh, throughout the through the entire circuit is this I naught sine omega t. Ah, with the phase, I forgot the phase angle. We need the phase angle because it is actually shifted. 
And to get that phase angle, that is, so we can take the equation in the book and set the impedance of the capacitor to zero. So the tangent of phi is equal to the impedance of the inductor over the resistor. So omega L over R. I will let you guys plug those numbers in. And th then, actually, let me leave everything up on the board. I've just set the impedance of the capacitor to zero in the equation from your book. And then our um, current as a function of time is equal to the amplitude of the current times sine omega t minus that phase shift. So you get the amplitude of the current um, from this, and you get the phase shift from that. Um, this is omega, and this gives you the functional form of the current. Then, this is the current through the circuit. The current across the inductor is uh, the voltage divided by the impedance of the inductor sine omega t minus pi over 2 Going to give this marker a little bit of a break. Just getting tired. There we go. New marker, much clearer. Ah, this should be why not. And our, uh, our current through our resistor is I naught sine omega t because there is no phase shift. And then the voltage is the voltage across the different elements. Ah, let's see. Sorry, this is, let me, let me tweak this. I want the voltage across the elements, and I am going to, so voltage it divided, voltage is impedance divided by, voltage is, imp, is current times impedance. So here, this is the impedance of the inductor times I naught, this is, the impedance of the resistor, or R, times I naught. This one is in phase with the source. This one is shifted by pi over 2. So with this work, I have gotten these three. Um, and then our average power is... Uh, for the, so for this one, it is zero, and that means that the average power across the resistor has to equal the average power across the source. And that average power across the resistor and the source is one half I naught V naught cosine of the phase angle. I naught is from here, V naught is from here, and we figured out the phase angle right there. So 
I haven't put the numbers in for you, but I've shown you how you get them. And that last example tells you just about everything you need to know about how to calculate stuff for AC circuits. So go forth and calculate.